I'm very happy to uh, welcome Frank Pasquale uh, this evening. He's one of the leading scholars on algorithmic accountability and professor of law at the University of Maryland in the US. His research focuses on the challenges posed to information law by rapidly changing technology, particularly in the field of healthcare, the internet and finance industries. Um, if you search Frank on the internet, you will find that he's a member of quite a number of councils and uh, advisory boards and that he writes a lot. <laughs> Uh, in 2015, he published a very interesting book, um, this one, uh, The Black Box Society, The Secret Algorithms That Control Money and Information, uh, and he will soon be publishing another book. Um, Ah, to, um, so to those who don't know the book yet, uh, I will just say one short quote um, and then I think everyone will basically know um, just in one <laughs> sentence what he wants to, uh, wants to say and everything else I guess he will say later. Um, um, but while powerful businesses, finance institutions and government agency hide their actions behind non-disclosure agreements, proprietary methods and gag rules, our lives are increasingly open books. The law, so aggressively protective of secrecy in the world of commerce, is increasingly silent when it comes to privacy of person. Um, yes, I guess he will say more later. Um, also with us tonight is um, Algorithm Watch. I got to know them uh, about one year ago uh, when they announced their formation. Algorithm Watch is a non-profit initiative to evaluate and shed light on algorithmic decision-making processes that have relevance to social, um, um, social uh, relevant things. <laughs> meaning they are used uh, either to predict or to prescribe human action or to make uh, decisions um, automatically. They watch and they try to explain effects of algorithmic decision-making processes and point out ethical uh, conflicts. As a network, they are linking experts from different disciplines and assist in developing ideas and strategies to make these processes understandable. With us tonight are the co-founders uh, Lorena Jan Palassi, a researcher and philosophy, um, a researcher on a researcher on philosophy of law and politics in the digital era, um, Lorenz Matzat, um, a journalist and software entrepreneur with focus on data journalism, and Matthias Spielkamp, a journalist and uh, author and uh, co-founder of uh, iRights Info. Um, Lorena and Matthias will be uh, discussing with me and Frank after um, Frank's lecture and then we all welcome you to um, also discuss with us. So uh, please welcome Frank. Thanks. Is that, is that good? Oh good, okay. So yeah, so the um, the booklet on the smart city is available in the back with my co-author, uh, Jathan Sadowski and I. Jathan teaches, I think, over in Amsterdam now. And um, that was, uh, and I've done some other videos uh, with, uh, for the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, uh, but it's just fantastic to be here in person. So to start with the talk tonight and thinking about holding algorithms accountable, here's some, a conceptual framework that I'll start with and then I'll go into more concrete applications of this conceptual framework that I think should be guiding a lot of the future of democratic regulation of technology. Because just to pull back from a second from the topic of algorithms, the fundamental question that we really are here to address tonight is whether we can, as a society, democratically guide how algorithms are developed, how software is developed, how data is collected, analyzed, and used about us, or whether we are the subjects of these shaping forces. And I think that is really a tough question, and it's one where I think a lot of the people who are in control of data collection, analysis, and use, and of the writing of software algorithms, would like to say that that's a purely technical question, that it's a question to be answered by those with the most knowledge of software or those who have, or more likely, 
those who have enough capital to buy the talents of those who have the most uh, knowledge of coding uh, software, et cetera. And the reason why I got into this topic is in the course of thinking for about 10 years about uh, search engine algorithms and their regulation, about the use of algorithms in finance, and about reputational scores. And there are now in the US about 8,000 distinct reputational scores that people can be ranked and rated on, on topics ranging from their employment, their credit history, their um, health status, their reliability, their likelihood to be a terrorist, et cetera. As I was thinking about these, I really thought that, you know, rather than the traditional categories of state versus market or of politics versus economics, I think a more useful framing often is different sectors in society that combine state and market forces within other sectors. And so I've tried to, in the book, Black Box Society, move us from a framework of thinking about, say, clashes between state and market to a thinking about combined state market actors who act either in the field of reputation, which is how we are seen by the world, the field of search, which is how we see the world, and that's sort of like media studies as well could be, would be there, and in the field of finance, which is increasingly the field of power without violence or force, although there's plenty of violence and force when it is arrayed uh, sometimes by financial, uh, those with financial power. So this question of reputation and search we will focus on tonight, the algorithms of reputation and search, and how algorithms can create scores about us and how they order the fundamental media tools that so many people use to understand reality, to find media, to find products, um, uh, other things like that, either via Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, sometimes Microsoft, these, these major companies. I'll start with reputation algorithms. So, and we'll start with some very simple forms of regulation that are existing either in uh, the US or in Europe, and then try to move to some more advanced ones. So the easiest example of a reputational algorithm or the most direct one that I think we have the most historical history of or historical record experience of is a credit score, okay? And in the United States, these credit scores are put together by three different institutions. They are based on an algorithmic weighting of different factors about an individual, and they can primarily include payment history, but they can also include lots of other characteristics about individuals. Now, one of the things that is really interesting about the history of credit scoring in the US is that there are about 24 million people that don't have enough of a record to be scored. Okay, so they don't have enough data about them to be entered into the algorithms to produce a reliable score about their credit history. One of the big battles that's going on now in the United States is whether other firms should be able to score people's creditworthiness on the basis of other like digital data about them, like their internet search history, their mobile phone use, how they walk, like that could be sort of monitored by your phone. Um, all these other sorts of questions, there's now sale questions of selling utility data. Um, President Trump recently uh, had appointed a head of the Federal Communications Commission that wants to be, uh, be able to allow, that wants to allow the major internet serve firms to sell people's web search history, et cetera. All of that could be data that would be used for, say, the 24 million unscored people under traditional methods to be scored algorithmically for their creditworthiness. And what's so interesting about this is that it's often framed as a mechanism of financial inclusion, right? It's saying, well, there are these people on the margins that aren't treated by the normal system, and we're going to include them. I want to say that instead of accepting that pretty neoliberal narrative of the more data that we have about people, the more reliably we can assess them and the more accurately we can score them, I want to sort of counter that by saying that there are probably forms of data that should not be allowed in any credit determinations. Okay, including particularly health data, but I'd also sort of question other forms of data trade-offs that are made. And this gets to a really important question about whether, when we're thinking about data regulation, we actually want to say that some forms of data about people are inalienable, that even with consent, they cannot allow others to either gather them or use them about them, 
or if we want to go to a completely individualistic framework that would say it's part of your right to sell any data you want to about yourself, right? And the reason why I am particularly worried about the very individualistic approach of saying everyone has a right to sell any data or let any data be used about themselves for any purpose is because of a problem called unraveling. And this is sort of an economic theory of privacy that states that once you have a critical mass of people willing to reveal something about themselves, like let's say that they're applicants on a job market and a certain group of them are revealing their grades or what grades they had in school, once that group of people that is, is self-revealing reaches a certain critical mass, anyone who doesn't reveal the information about themselves looks like they have something to hide, right? And this is sort of Joel, this leads to Joel Reidenberg's theory of the transparent citizen. It leads to Scott Peppett's theories of, um, the fa of worrying about the unraveling of privacy that will happen if you allow these sorts of data exchanges to occur. So that's one initial idea about keeping algorithmic systems of reputational scoring accountable that I want to put on the table is this very difficult question we're going to face on whether we want to create or ban the uses of certain data in certain scoring situations, even at risk of continuing the marginalization of individuals who are not being scored under the traditional methods because that data doesn't uh, exist about them. Um, or uh, are we ready to accept that inalienability of certain personal data or do we think that essentially it's always going to come down to a question of individual consent about control about data about them? All right, I began at the, with the idea of data collection, analysis, and use. So now let me get into the question of analysis, okay? So if we're thinking about people's credit scores, are we going to, for example, require scoring companies or entities which try to assess the creditworthiness of individuals to take on excuses, like if they have an excuse and say, the reason why I was late on this payment was because I had this family crisis, or the reason I was late on this payment was because there was a big storm that knocked out my house, my power for a month, or something like that. Unfortunately, in the, in the US, even that is seen as controversial, a state requirement to do that. There was actually legislation that was introduced, uh, or a bill that was introduced after Hurricane Katrina to sort of give relief to people who were suffered from a hurricane, you know, from having negative marks on their credit score because of the disruption in their lives after the hurricane. And the, unfortunately, the industry said, no, we can't allow that, you know. And so what's amazing to me is that there's this real lack of humanity and compassion in some of these algorithmic systems. And that's one of the ways in which I've been moving in terms of my, my feelings about the smart city. You know, I talked earlier about the smart city pamphlet I have back there with Jathan. It's that we have so much emphasis on artificial intelligence, smart cities, et cetera. Where's the artificial compassion? Where's the sense of justice, of mercy, of any other human values that make life worth living? You know, if we are not continually embedding those into our automated systems, if we have simply an artificially intelligent system, then we can expect all the cruelty and uh, disregard of human values that would be inherent in a purely rational, self-interest maximizing system to develop. So I think that's really critical, you know, as we move from, say, a discussion of the algorithmic to a discussion of the artificial, artificially intelligent. So again, I would say in terms of analysis, it's important to have some regulatory pressure and inspection of exactly what's going on when data is being analyzed for whether we're credit worthy or not or something like that. I'd also say that it's really important to keep data from different spheres from entering into, say, other spheres, right? So the fact that somebody, say, has certain problems in terms of their life as a tenant shouldn't necessarily inform how they're being treated in some other spheres of life um, without some sort of notice to them or effort to or ability to appeal. So again, that's one other, you know, and again, these are not radical ideas. They're, they're just, I think, relatively straightforward applications of due process principles to algorithmic systems that are taking on more and more of a judicial role. They're more and more judging us. Finally, we've gone through collection, we've gone through analysis, now we go through use. What's very scary, uh, at least in the US context for these credit scores, is they're being used in many areas outside of credit. So for example, they might inform how much your car insurance is. They might inform, say, a, a person trying to give you a job or something like that. And so this is an area where, again, we run the risk of what Kathy O'Neill has called you know, cascades of disadvantage, 
where somebody has a difficult time and they get a bad score because of one aspect of their life, and then they find that it hurts them in other aspects of their life. That's something to really watch out for. And I've been talking to some of the data protection authorities and others here who are going to be interpreting the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation here in Europe. And it's something that I think they are watching out for, and I, but I think it's gonna take a lot of citizen agitation. The reason it's gonna take a lot of citizen agitation and political pressure here is because all that I've talked about is very hard to figure out if it's even happening if corporations assert a trade secrecy defense, okay? And if you look at, for example, the emergent right of explanation that was part of the 1995 European Commission Data Protection Directive and that is now being formalized in the 2018 General Data Protection Regulation, what's really tragic about it is, is that this right of explanation is supposed to give people a way of understanding how they have been profiled or how their information has been processed by an algorithmic system. But whenever push comes to shove, very often the companies that run these systems say, oh, it's a trade secret, and for us to reveal that, that would be losing us valuable, valuable intellectual property. And this is very worrisome because if you really take some of these corporate defenses to their ultimate conclusion, what ends up happening is, is that when we start talking about algorithmic systems and we start talking about how to regulate them, they say, well, whatever we do with data on the front end, that's part of our trade secret protected process. And then in the US, thankfully not in other countries, they have much more, almost any, every, any country other than the US has a more rational approach to freedom of expression. Um, but in the US, they say anything we say about people, anything we score people with, or any score we come up with, that that is free expression. And that's completely unregulable, okay? So everything that goes into the algorithm is secret, Everything that comes out is unregulable free expression. It's a pretty nice game to play, right? If you were trying to think of a way to render corporate power completely unaccountable, I can't think of a better way. And this is something I started writing about in 2009 in an article called Search Secrecy and the Inversion of Network Neutrality. But it's just sort of happening at a more and more uh, accelerated pace to this day. So moving on, that was the, that my first example in terms of credit scoring, I think you could apply to a lot of forms of scores, including health scores, um, uh, and, and there are some really scary health scores going on now. There's already a company in the US that is uh, scoring people's health on the basis of their face. And so there's a facial recognition algorithm that converts, say, what a person's face is to a weight range and a BMI range for them that could be used by life insurers and other things like that. Um, there's also, by the way, um, uh, Chinese researchers at Shanghai Zhaotong University recently published a study that was called um, Inference of Criminality from Facial Features. And from 2,000 uh, faces of criminals and non-criminals, they came up with four ideal typical faces of criminal faces, three ideal typical non-criminal faces. Um, aside from the, the really terrible echoes of phrenology and um, that, that this, uh, and even um, uh, eugenics that this, this calls to mind, what it also calls to mind is extremely sloppy science because you know, it was by no means clear that these people's faces hadn't been altered by the experience of prison itself, right? And so the problem becomes that you know, in many of these, these uh, situations, including in the law, there is so much enthusiasm for machine learning, it almost seems like a magical process, that there's very little questioning of the process. And what really amazed me about the, the Shanghai Zhaotong paper was that they actually said, we've finally found a totally non-discriminatory way to, <laughs> to process people to see who might be a criminal because the machine obviously has no bias, right? But, but I hope we can discuss in Q&A, you know, why we would really have questions about exactly, you know, that, why, why this is really troubling as a way of uh, processing information. I think one clue is that part of the cornerstone of any legitimate legal system is an ability to explain what is happening, right? So if it is simply that you have an algorithm that through a neural network or through other forms of, uh, uh, other forms of learning is just sort of associating features with criminality based on some you know, very imperfect training set, now there's no real humanly, explicable, uh, humanly explainable aspect of that machine learning. I will say though that when I talk about humanly explainable, this is really setting up a great clash. Now that, that 
paper that I discussed to the facial, the China, inf criminal re inference from facial recognition, that's obviously a pretty ridiculous idea. But it foreshadows a big epistemological clash that's going to happen between partisans of algorithmic and machine learning type of understanding and those on the outside. And the reason why I say this is there was recently an article in Nature called, Can We Unlock the Black Box? Can We Explain How Machine Learning Systems Are Actually Making Decisions? And some of the researchers said, look, the way to deal with this is actually to make your models simpler, and that will at least render them susceptible to challenge, right? And that's where, say, if you had a credit score that was based on four variables, say one was payment history, and there were like three others, say length of time of employment, time at their house, et cetera, that sort of simple model of someone's creditworthiness would be much, could be less accurate than one that takes in a thousand variables about the person, but the one with a thousand variables does not, it's not explicable, right? And similarly with that facial recognition one, you couldn't really explain that in a human way, how, why it came across, why it came up with those four types of faces that were the most likely to be criminal. Um, but sometimes when judicial authorities, other critics challenge machine reasoning, some partisans of machine learning say, you don't understand what machine learning does is sort of the next step in our mental evolution. And to try to explain what the machine learning algorithm is doing to a human is like trying to explain Shakespeare to a dog, okay? And I think it's gonna be very critical to resist that type of rationalization of inscrutable machine learning systems whenever they are in human affairs. Now, if there's a way in which a machine learning system can, through trial and error and repeated experience, find a way to carve a tunnel through a mountain better than a human team can, I'm all for that, that's great. But if we have the same system trying to say, project who is most likely to be a criminal, who's most likely to be creditworthy, who is most likely to get sick and die within the next five years, if that's happening, I don't think these systems should be permitted um, without some forms of explanation. That last example, though, I gave is quite controversial because if you look at W. Nicholson's Price's article on black box medicine, he talks about how there are some doctors and others who really do want to see the advance of black box methods uh, within medicine. And perhaps we'd have to make sure that that was always being used in conjunction with a doctor for personal treatment. So that might be one way to limit the effect of such an algorithm, right? Um, but I still think that it's very important for us to start grappling with these terms and to start um, uh, really making sure that we have some way of limiting the effects of these algorithms, particularly when they have this, uh, this sort of uh, inscrutability or aura of inscrutability around them. So those are some examples um, from reputation that I've gone through. I next wanna go through search because that's of uh, a great interest. And I think of essentially, I call the search sector all the intermediaries that come between us and content. So, and I know that you know, for many people, they don't need Google to find the top news story they wanna read. They don't need Google or Twitter to find that. They don't need a Facebook news feed to find, say, their favorite newspaper or something. But I think that what we also have to acknowledge is that for a lot of people, they are increasingly sort of defaulting to feeds. They are defaulting to, say, searches when they look for things. And as they do, I think it is good for competition authorities, consumer protection authorities, to be really mindful of how the algorithms in Google and Facebook are, and Amazon and, and Apple are organizing things. To give just a few examples, um, for some time, Google has been trying to take up more and more of the first page of search results with its own properties, right? And that's something that is really worrisome for entrepreneurs or really for anybody who wants to sort of have a, an unconcentrated web because if you're always being pushed down further and further by Google's own properties, then it's really hard to compete effectively. And I think just yesterday, one of the agencies of the European Commission, not in the competition area, but another agency said that they were very concerned because they found that sort of small businesses were being pushed around by um, 
Amazon and uh, other, other companies that were being really non-transparent about how they arranged the search results. And it's really easy to imagine how they could use the power over a secret algorithm to really uh, influence and to take in a lot more money because you could just say Amazon could, if they wanted to, say to any maker of, say, to any book publisher, well, if you give us 10% of the profits or 10% of the revenue from the book, we'll weight your books a little bit more than the other books. But if you give us 20% of the profit, we'll double that weight. And if you give us 50% of the profit, we'll quadruple that weight, right? And by the way, all of these companies, again, I'm sorry, you know, I, I sometimes come across a bit parochial because I have so many American examples, but on the other hand, they are American companies and they sort of are bringing these, I think, rather troubling American values and America and a sense of, of, of the American economy with them. And if you look at the jurisprudence of shelf space purchasing in US retail stores, all these sorts of games were seen and were theorized by the Chicago School um, of Antitrust as being totally fine, you know. They like, oh, it's totally fine if we just have these very powerful retailers and, you know, there's very, gonna be these other uh, makers of things. And to the extent that the retailers push around the people who are selling things, like publishers, that's great. That'll just make them be more efficient, et cetera. But I think we've gotta be able to push back economically and say, wait a second, you know, once one entity has just so much power over media, in the case of Facebook, over finding certain things in the face of Google, over a lot of products in the case of Amazon, we have to be sure that they can't use that sort of power to search and rank um, against um, the suppliers too brutally. Also, what we're finding is that they're using it against us. So there's a book about, called Virtual Competition by Ezrahi and Stuki that was recently uh, published. Um, full disclosure, same press as me. Um, but uh, they, I, think we're, I think Harvard Press is doing some really good stuff on competition law right now. And that's one of the good books. And what they've pointed out is that a lot of times the data gathering that is done about individuals, it can be used against you just as much it can be, as it can be used for you. So what you're really seeing is that the platform in the middle between the buyers and the sellers of things, it's not like it is a faithful agent of you as a principal if you're the consumer and it's not like it's a faithful agent of the sellers. It can really betray each. And without a lot more transparency about how, say, Amazon is algorithmically pricing things, cha changing prices, altering those prices, et cetera, it's hard to know if it's actually really helping or if it's just sort of trying to figure out some sort of algorithmic way of squeezing both ends uh, to, to imp improve the profits of the middle. The reason I think that's particularly important with respect to algorithms here is because, according to Azrahi and Stuckey's work, a lot of times what we, when we go online, you think that you're a rational, cons like, well, many people think. <laughs> I won't, perhaps not this crowd, but, but many, many people think that they are rational consumers going online and finding the best deals. But the way, as Rahe and Stuckey say, right, Marv, model the problem, they say it's like the Truman Show. They say that the way that large platforms have so much knowledge about your weaknesses, what really excites you, what you dislike, et cetera, is that they are able to manipulate you in order to manipulate you towards buying certain things and against others or to sort of push you in certain directions and away from others in ways you can never understand. You may never know that you know, the reason why you are seeing a particular um, CD or seeing a particular form of music or seeing a particular uh, 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 thing is, is being uh, um, marketed to you is because of an email you wrote five or six years ago. Or you may not know that there is um, data at some of these companies that can infer from, say, the clothes that you're wearing, what your income is, or other issues like that. You know, you may not know that there are just these thousands of different ways in which the offer made to you could be altered by things that are extraneous to the purchasing decision. So I think those are important things, and I think to hold these account our algorithms accountable, transparency may be a first step, but it's certainly not the last step. One of the most important things that you know, came out of the European Commission's antitrust investigation against Google is the insistence that you would have at least three non-Google properties on the top of any search engine results page. Now that hasn't ultimately been put into law, it's not part of any judgment, but it was offered by Google when Jorge Almonia was in charge of the investigation. And I think it should be part of any uh, conclusion that uh, Margaret Vestager you know, pr pursues as the head of the Competition Commission because at least we'd try to guarantee that 
or at least we'd try to stop the use of algorithmic power to cut out competitors to industries that are gradually being sucked into these very, very large tech firms. And by the way, what's really amazing is if you look at the Wikipedia page for the mergers and acquisitions of any of these companies, I think they go at the pace of like two a week, right? So I mean, there's just so many things that are sort of being sucked into this sort of monopoly digital capitalism that I think we really have to watch for as we're looking at these algorithms. All right, so I've gone through reputation, I've gone through search. The last thing I wanna go through is finance. And I think that one of the biggest problems, at least in contemporary financial markets, is that there is such an emphasis on speed, scale, and speculation. So the reason for the rise of algorithmic trading in a lot of equities markets is you have people that they wanna take advantage of just micro, very tiny changes in prices. And because of that, they rather than contracting directly with one another as people, they set up bots and algorithms to set up uh, trades and to execute trades. And this is an area where there has been an assumption by a lot of regulatory authorities that they are supposed to try to set up markets so that trades can be executed as fast as possible. And I think this was just a deep misconception about the nature of financial trading. I think what they really should have been thinking about, and I, I elaborate this in an article called Law's Acceleration of Finance, I think what they really should have been thinking about is they should have been thinking when they were sort of developing trading rules that allowed for more and more and faster and faster algorithms to enter into stock markets, the better thing to have thought about was, look, if two or three trades or bids or orders come in at the same second, or perhaps let's say at the same uh, hundredth of a second, that's a tie. You can set up rules that could change that, that can, uh, for that such a, a tie in any way that you want. You could say that, say, if three come in at the same time, one third goes to each party. You could say that, you know, maybe it's uh, done randomly. You could do something else like that. I think the problem here is, and I'm not going to say that I want any particular mode of distribution when there is a tie, when, say, stock orders come in at the same time. But what I, the reason why I bring up the example of algorithmic trading is because I think it's very important to realize that sometimes regulatory authorities just seem to be sleepwalking and they don't really think about the underlying purposes of the activity that they're regulating. And so in that case, you know, I just think that, it, that we could so easily even stop a lot of this just by taxing these trades just a hundredth of a penny or a tenth of a penny. Um, and to do that, I think, would lead to much more stability in financial markets and would raise a lot of money too and would help shift some of the burden of um, uh, taxation away from income and real property and towards financial instruments, as Thomas Piketty has you know, suggested repeatedly, um, most recently in his critique of Macron's uh, finance policies. So I just sort of want to bring that up because when I think about finance and algorithms, one of the most important things we have to face, and, on, and I would say the two things that are sort of the critical challenges that this talk sort of brings up, the one was the example of you know, Shakespeare for a dog, the, the epistemo is the epistemology of machine learning setting, setting itself up as something superior to human knowledge. The second is really forthrightly facing the fact that the companies that have the most data and the best uh, uh, right now are like, that is a self-reinforcing advantage and they're likely to get more and more powerful over time, not less and less. And as they do so, I think that the critical answer to holding algorithms accountable is going beyond the transparency points I made earlier, going beyond sort of tweaking the reputational analysis that I made earlier, going beyond all of that is an ability to tax the entities that are making the most off of algorithms that are based on data that is ultimately work that we have done, right? Ultimately, the algorithm, that, what's the secret of machine learning and a lot of artificial intelligence that supercharges these algorithms, makes them so powerful, is work that we have done. And finding a way to share, fairly distribute the fruits of that labor is one of the greatest challenges for 21st century politics, but fortunately it is something that people like Jaron Lanier, um, Terry Fisher, others have addressed in their work. Um, but I think a very early first step is just sort of making sure that we don't let ourselves become a society where because data is so important to advertising, so much revenue is going to intermediaries and they're taking away all the revenue that would normally ordinarily have gone to the content makers that make people use the web anyway. 
So I just think that that's a very important aspect of algorithmic accountability to, uh, to think about. It's not something that's usually thought of in the field. And that's where I'll sort of, uh, in my concluding thoughts, I wanna really make one key emphasis about this whole name of algorithmic accountability for as a field. The movement started, or could probably be said to have started, as a named movement of algorithmic accountability about five to 10 years ago with some of the work that Helen Nissenbaum did, at least in the US context, um, but the work that Helen Nissenbaum at NYU did at a conference called Algorithms and Accountability. The first major one was in 2013. And at that conference, I was very excited about the future of algorithmic accountability because I felt that we were finally finding a way to bring the knowledge of attorneys, social scientists, journalists, and others to the tech industry and to computer science. What has happened though over the past four or five years is that I find often the more we try to push for algorithm, algorithmic accountability, which to me means making the companies and people who write algorithms and who profit from them accountable for the problems that they cause, the more we've pushed that meaning of algorithmic accountability, the more we've met with pushback that essentially says, ah, you mean you want to make accountability algorithmic, right? And that's a very different thing because if you make accountability algorithmic, that is trying to say, well, we'll abide by what you want, just give us an algorithm so we can do it easily, right? So for example, with the right to be forgotten, this is a, a classic example under, under the uh, European data protection laws, there is a, uh, there are, protections that are given to individuals so that they can take off from search engine results, they can remove from the search engine results on their name as a name query, certain items that are either false or excessive or troubling or there are a variety of different categories, right? And at first it seemed as though Google would be very resistant to that, then they started to sort of process it. But what they increasingly want to do there, I think, which is following from the example of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and some sort of copyright uh, ways of, of dealing with copyright content online, is they want to make the process of removing this material algorithmic. So it's almost like give us step one, two, and three, and one, either yes or no, check, 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 checking boxes to decide on how to do this. And ultimately, a lot of times, these are disputes that can be very difficult and really require a sort of narrative explanation that reflects the human values at stake and particularly the conflict between the privacy rights of the individual who's affected and the public interest right in knowing, say, what might be something really important about the person. And just to make it very concrete, for uh, just give one, one example, there was a woman whose uh, husband was murdered 20 years before her case. So I think it was like in 1994 or 95. And every time anyone would search for her name, all 10 search results that would come up on her name were stories about the murder of her husband. And so she said, look, I don't want this to sort of dog me for life as the first Google search result on my name. And I'm sure there are people that, you know, when they go on a blind date or when they just meet somebody or whatever, they would just do a Google search and, you know, or, or bosses might do something like this. Even though it might be illegal under certain laws, they still might do it. I mean, who, who can really enforce against that sometimes? And she said, you know, I'd want this taken down. She said, I want this algorithm that seems to think that the most important thing about my existence is the murder of my husband 20 years ago to respond to my human need to have a fresh start and to get beyond that. And I think that that's an example where um, Google made the right decision. They, they acceded to this request. Um, and, uh, but it's hard to imagine how all human scenarios could be sort of channeled into or programmed into an algorithmic form such that you could automate, say, decisions like that, right? So I think that that's part of this, the message I want to deliver about algorithmic accountability tonight is that it's really important that we realize that it's gonna be very hard to program these things. And in some ways, we should embrace that because to the extent that something is hard or we even deem it impossible to program, that foreshadows a future where there are independent occupations and professions that are not sort of subordinated to computer science or technology, right? <laughs> because if you do buy into a, a, an idea of the future 
which is quite tempting, right? That everything could be sort of recorded and all that you do in a day could be recorded and turned into data and then sort of your job could be automated by computer science. Then ultimately the people that sort of run the society are going to be computer scientists, right? They're just going to be deciding the, the sequence and pace of what jobs get automated next. But if you buy into a future where there are lots of aspects of human experience and society that cannot be automated, then I think you can envision a future where there are what Michael Walzer calls you know, separate spheres of expertise or excellence um, where you know, there can be a, a diversity of professions and a diversity of sort of modes of work. So those are sort of the main ideas that I want to get across in terms of making algorithms accountable. I think that I've given some examples for about data use, data collection, data collection, data analysis, and data use in the reputation context. I've given the example of the search engine results page in the search context. I've suggested some ideas about taxation and the fair distribution of the benefits from automation in the finance context. And I've finally given a warning about when we talk about algorithmic accountability, let's not constrain, con con let's not construe that as trying to make accountability procedures more algorithmic. Rather, let's construe that as how do we make computer scientists, coders, others who are in charge of the most important technological entities in our lives, how do we make them more responsive to ex extant commitments we have to things like due process, to compassion, to mercy, to justice, to other human values that really need now to be consciously placed into technological systems lest they be lost entirely. So, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Frank. It was very interesting. Um, I would like to ask um, you, Lorena. Um, you're one of the founders of Algorithm Watch. You want to push this topic into um, the German discussion. Um, do you about agree with the um, with the points that Frank just made? Um. Well, thank you very much. Well. <laughs> Um, yeah, we, we, we started this initiative because we also see a necessity for a discussion, a more objective discussion, a more, a more nuanced discussion um, than the debate that we've been having in Germany and within Europe for the last, let's say, five to six years. It's indeed, it's a long, it, it is even an older discussion. Um, scientists, but also practitioners have been discussing this for a while now. And from the point of the theory of science, um, we've been discussing this even longer. Um, because when we talk about algorithms, we talk about specific ways of computing and doing statistics, to put it very, in a very simple way. So, um, so we do think that there is a need uh, for, for discussion. And we see with concern that there are many aspects and many consequences erasing from um, automatization that um, are not addressed neither legally nor ethically. And we see that there is a blind spot there. Um, and this was one of the reasons why we started uh, with uh, this. At first, it was initiative. Right now, we are an NGO. Um, and um, to me, um, one of the main points that I'm trying to address right now is um, the, the differentiation uh, within the risks and fears that we have with regards to algorithmic um, misuse or um, automatization misuse. Um, the two main points that we are all discussing right now, I think most of scholars at least, is um, privacy. Uh, points. This is one of the, the, the main topics. And the other point is about discrimination. 
And um, of course, there are many other points that you can see there where you can say, OK, w th this needs to be addressed. And this also has an ethical dimension or a, a legal dimension as well. Um, but those two main points, at least in Europe, um, have been addressed over data protection, especially. Um, and uh, for me, they, they are very different things. Um, a privacy, um, a problem of privacy is always a very individual problem because privacy is very much about ha being uh, independent and having autonomy from political and economical restraints. It's about not having political actors, not having the private sector or, poli or economical entities influencing your freedom, but just being separated from that part of your life. That's what, what I call the private, this is what also Habermas, but also many other philosophers have been thinking about when the concept of privacy was being developed within the last hundreds of years. And um, so that's a very individualistic thing, right? It's our individualistic right of being private, of having that autonomy for ourselves, for our friends, and dev um, socialize in a different sphere. Um, and then there's discrimination. And discrimination, actually, it's a collective thing. People are being discriminated, not because of them being a specific individual, but because of their belonging to a specific group. So. The person of color is being beaten by the neo-Nazi, not because he is Michael um, Ogia, but because that person has that skin color and is being um, associated to a certain concept or idea of group and category. And one of the things that we do in modern societies to address or try to eliminate discrimination is that we turned individualistic. So we said, OK, to avoid discrimination, we give everyone individual rights, individual fundamental rights. And that is a smart move to circumvent discrimination. But that is not a, an answer to discrimination. You don't answer the point of discrimination. You just simply try to avoid that. And with that, um, we have the first problem, because the way to address discrimination is not from an individual perspective, but it's from a perspective of collective concepts and discussing collectives and um, having a debate from a different um, level and approach that cannot be addressed by individual rights, because it's about protecting collectives. It's about making collectives equal to other collectives. It's also about understanding that the fact that we human beings create categories of collectives leads to discrimination, but also give us a gold standard to see whether some collectives are better off than other collectives. So it's, 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 it's an important point to understand that right now the human rights that we have are very individualistic and are not able to address this point. And the thing that happens with digitization is even worse, because what we do um, towards discrimination is that we, don't, we not only keep in this individualistic way of addressing discrimination, but we additionally privatize discrimination, making discrimination and privacy a data protection issue, as, it, as if it was the same thing, as if being pregnant is a private issue as if being gay is a private issue. But it is not a private issue, it's a personal issue. But it's there in the open. If I'm pregnant, uh, I'm, so everyone's going to see it within a few months. I can hide it for a few months, but then the rest is not. So making that private means putting that person in, hiding that person to avoid that that person is discriminated. Um, Saying being gay is a private thing implies that you cannot go in public with that because that's private, right? It means that personal things that depend on socialization. So, of course, 
the LGBT community needs a way to have a public sphere for them to socialize, to flirt, to do whatever they want to do. And with privatizing that, what you do is that you indirectly create a concept of what is normal and cannot be discriminated, and a concept of what is not normal and might be discriminated, and thus needs to be privatized or made private. So um, I think in Germany, we had a fantastic way to address discrimination, for instance, in the um, uh, public health insurances, where we said we're a social um, insurance, and by now it doesn't matter anymore whether you're a woman or a man, you pay the same price. Before that regulation, women used to pay more. Um, so that was a, way, a good way to address discrimination, because you just go to the core of what discrimination implies. So that knowing whether that's a woman that is your client for your insur as an insurance or, or, or a man, it, it's not relevant anymore, because it's not possible to make that information relevant. And besides, there are many other things. I mean, the perspective of being a woman, being a woman, you cannot privatize that. There are so many data types and that information that you cannot privatize. It's simply because it's wide in the open. Many of you wear glasses, so I know that you have a health problem with your eyes. <laughs> and, and there are many other things that make it difficult. Um, so I think, in, in my opinion, where I, when I look at algorithms and I look what algorithms do is exactly that collectivistic point. Individuals for algorithms are not important. Algorithms mainly take a look at individuals to classify them in different types of collectives, to make profiles so that they can put them in different drawers. So if you have that individual person and that person doesn't want to be followed by an algorithm and somehow achieves um, to fly from that, to, to hide from that algorithmic process, um, then um, a similar person with a similar profile might enter in. It doesn't matter. It's not important because it's about just understanding different types of collectives. And because algorithms do that, um, and because we have a democratic society that is very much regulated on the concept of individualism, we have a problem here. And we can see it, for instance, with predictive policing. Um, you can have uh, predictive policing, I don't know if you've heard about it, this is a way uh, with which police tries to sort of, um, in, in Germany it's been applied already, and uh, it's being used in some Bundeslanders, in some others it's not being used, they are discussing it to use it, and they want to use it um, against um, robbery. Um, and the thing is, they are using it without using personal data, so the data protection officers say, that's perfectly fine, you can use it, it's, uh, it's as wide as a freedom uh, um, tower, how you say that? It's, a f um, it's that fly bird. Hmm. Oh, thank you very much. It's, it's as wide as a, fly, as, as a freedom pigeon, right? And, um, and the thing with that, uh, with, that um, with the use of predictive policing is that you can actually create no-go areas within a society, within a, within a, within a city. Uh, and that um, cannot be addressed by data protection because it's an individual right, and there is no single individual that can come from wedding and say, well, I'm being discriminated because the police is coming every day here, um, etc. Our law system would tell that person, okay, you can move to Kreuzberg, right? Or you can move to, I don't know, Mitte. So you're not being subject of discrimination. And that's one of the points where we see that exactly um, that collective approach of algorithms is not being seen ethically in the discussions that we have, and it's not being also approached by the regulator when we take a look at what rights are being considered, what, what laws are being considered to address those issues. So that's my point. Um, yes, uh, I, I believe 
this is true. Um, so, <laughs> um, so, so now um, we are with the problem, which is, I guess, mainly a political problem. Um, the algorithms categorize, they discriminate, and um, I would like to ask you, Matthias, um, do you have um, ideas what could uh, be options to, um, to regulate this, or is regulation an option for you? Well, that's the billion dollar question, right? It's not a million dollar question anymore nowadays, it's a billion dollar question, or it's a multi-billion dollar question, whatever, you know, the numbers increase all the time. Uh, let me first say that um, I think that was a, a great talk you gave, Frank. Um, you addressed tons of issues that we also think about, and I mean, it's clear because the entire community is thinking about it. And I'd like to come back to at least a couple of them um, and to highlight those because I think we are on the same page there. Um, especially when you say that um, we need to find out how to make um, algorithms more accountable, not necessarily by making accountability algorithmically, but by looking at the people who are responsible for creating those algorithms, modeling the systems, um, coding the systems, and so on and so forth. That's exactly what, what we think is one way to go if we are talking about solutions. Now, it seems to be a long shot um, to increase the compassion of people to uh, increase or um, develop the ethical thinking of people who deal with that, uh, because this is not something that is, that is uh, taught at uh, for example, uh, schools or universities or computer science classes, but it's starting, you know, it's starting partly because of your work, partly because of other people's works, uh, work. Uh, there are um, organizations like um, the Association of uh, Computing Machinery, the um, um, IEEE, an association of electrical and electronics engineers, and they start producing ethical guidelines, accountability guidelines, and these accountability, accountability guidelines, of course, they need to be grounded in some idea of ethics and some idea of what is moral and what is not, right? So, so this is starting, and we think that's a great thing to happen. At the same time, um, we do see, and I, I don't even think that we disagree, but that is a point that you did not make, so I would like to come back to it. We do see that there's a value in using algorithmic systems, for example, to have better modeling of what is fair and just. And we do think that this can be done, that can be applied. For example, by uh, looking at different um, methods of how to find out uh, how a decision is being made, and then uh, looking at the data and see, for example, um, what different routes the systems took and whether there is an idea to optimize them. Probably some of you saw that story that ProPublica produced last year. It was called Machine Bias and it made some headlines worldwide in the community of people who care about algorithms and algorithmic decision making. Um, ProPublica is a research platform in the United States and they researched um, risk assessment, a risk assessment system that is used in the US justice system. Um, and it's being used to assess um, uh, criminals and what are their chances of, uh, you know, of, of, of staying clean or uh, um, the rate of recidivism. <laughs> um, so uh, committing a crime again, right? Um, and it was a big story because ProPublica came out with the headline that it's basically uh, biased against blacks. And that story was um, refuted by some people, not just by the company itself that produces the algorithms that uh, I'm in, uh, employed in, in those systems. I mean, you would expect that. But also by some independent researchers, other researchers who said, well, you know, what it comes down to, and in the end, you know, there's a, um, there's a researcher here in, in Germany, uh, Krishna Gumari from Max Planck uh, um, uh, Institute, and he basically focused it in one sentence, and he says, um, who's, who's right? Um, is it ProPublica, or is it um, uh, North Point, that is the company that produces this Compass um, risk assessment systems? They both are, 
they're using different measures of fairness, right? Um, sounds completely counterintuitive, but it is possible, and it's, I mean, you can easily explain it. If you want to optimize, for example, for uh, finding the most people who are likely to recommit a crime, you will have a different result than optimizing for um, people who, um, <laughs> that's the hard part, <laughs> you know, optimizing for the false positives, optimizing for the false positives, right? Uh, to uh, to uh, not um, have too many people who you expect to recommit a crime, but then they won't, you know, that's a false positive. Or you want to um, uh, optimize for uh, the false negatives, meaning that you expect too little people to recommit a crime and then you have more of those. Those are two different results that you want to come up with and so you're using two different methods. Now, in a certain setting, you can't optimize for both of those at the same time. So you have different measures there and you can algorithmically try to find out a way to optimize those two things, right? So there is a way to use technology to make the system fairer. Of course, I completely agree, and I think Lorena and, and Lorenz also agree with that, we need to have some insight in how these systems work. Whether we call that transparency, intelligibility, explainability, that's a different question, and we should debate that. But this is also part of what our thinking is when we're talking about these algorithms. Yes, we agree, don't make all this accountability algorithmically, but do use the um, technology to make society better or fairer, even. Um, do, you want to, do you want to respond to this directly, maybe? <laughs> no, I mean, I think that is a very powerful point, you know, in terms of, and I, I wanted to start with um, Lorena's points about, with, uh, with respect to discrimination and groups. And, and actually, this is a response that I think combines uh, both, both uh, uh, response to both of the uh, comments, which is, Algorithmic determinations look a lot better to the extent that the persons doing the job are bad, uh, or are bad at doing the job. So if you have, for example, a deeply racially discriminatory police force, and then you cabin what they're doing with some forms of algorithmic accountability, or at least just with data about you know, what they're doing, that can help. I want to use the example, I mean, two examples of how data has influenced judging already which is that um, I believe some Israeli researchers found that judges who sentenced defendants before lunch sentenced them to harsher, longer sentences than those who got sentenced after lunch. And clearly, you know, that was something the judges were not intending, but it just happened that, you know, they were feeling hungry and they were more punitive. Um, amazingly, in uh, Louisiana, uh, in the US, there was a uh, situation where the study from the National Bureau of Economic Research suggests that judges were more harsh with minority defendants on the week after their home football team lost, okay? Again, just, and these are deep defects with human judging. So anyone that wants to take a critical perspective with respect to algorithms, our first step has to be to never romanticize the existing human institutions. But the vision that I'm trying to put forward and that I think a lot of folks at Algorithm Watch and Beyond are trying to put forward is one in which the best of technology and big data and predictive analytics can be used to inform autonomous professions about what they do, right? I think that's the ideal. Um, and I'd, I'd love to go further into the, the discussion, yeah. Uh, no, no, it's working. Um, I just, I would like to do one short round, maybe here, and then we open um, to the public. Um, there, there will be the um, GDPR, the uh, European law. Um, do you believe that it will help us once it is um, in charge uh, next year, or um, do you think um, no chance? Should I start or I don't know. Yeah. You start. Okay, I'll start, I guess. Um, 
Oh, I, I think it's, it's uh, I mean, every time when I'm asked in the US, like, what needs to be the next step in privacy regulation, I tell the regulators that I talk to or other audiences, look at what Europe is doing, it's far ahead. You know, I mean, and, and it may not be adequate in many ways. I mean, certainly there are people like at the Oxford Internet Institute, Sandra Wachter and Luci Luciano Flordi, who've said that the right of explanation is, is too weak and that it's not going to lead to enough insight into algorithmic systems, you know, and they, they may be right, but I think there are also ways in which data protection authorities, particularly in Germany, given the history of the DPA here, could interpret it quite broadly, you know, and could interpret it in a very uh, helpful way. So I think that's one thing the GDPR helps with. Um, I think there are other aspects of the GDPR that are going to help a lot. And so I just think that there are, I have a lot of hope there, but I do think that, of course, you have to look back on the failure of the existing right of explanation that was part of the Data Protection Directive. And the big worry is gonna be, are, are the ways in which corporate power, other forms of power can deflect responsibility and accountability, are those going to trump a lot of what's going on with the GDPR and what it's trying to accomplish? Or is there going to be a, a line of jurisprudence and interpretation that really interprets it robustly? And I'm hoping for the latter, but yeah. Um, Lorena, um, if, if I understood you right, um, you are rather um, proposing putting programmers into philosophy classes um, <laughs> um, than, um, than doing harsh regulations. Um, would you like to um, give another word on that? <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm precisely saying that we need to think about regulation, but we need to think about regulation from a different angle because algorithms are showing us that we are not done yet with our thinking about democracy and that we're not done yet from our thinking about society from a democratic point of view. And that we've been regulating partially in a in a way that it doesn't work for society because we've been regulating either because we focused on the wrong factors. To put an example, privacy and public uh, and the public sphere, it was until now very much regulated on geographical terms. So in the moment where you leave the house, that was not the private sphere anymore. That's the way it was regulated. And suddenly the internet happened. And privacy and, and the public's place and the public, they, they just changed. And they were not able to be classified by saying, well, I'm on Twitter, but I'm at home. Um, so if I'm on Twitter, but, I, but I'm at home, I'm private, but if I'm on Twitter, but I'm outside home, I'm public, no, it doesn't work anymore like that. You might be naked in your uh, toilet uh, and tweeting, and there is a part of you that is not private, <laughs> and there is another part that it is. But that sort of shows that uh, we cannot think about those concepts with as, as, as room concept, as geographical concepts. The other thing that I was addressing is also the concept, collective concepts. We pretty much in the society have very much notions of collective value, of, collect, of um, public interest, of um, public good, but we don't have those concepts in legal terms. And uh, there are many good reasons from the democratic point of view to not address that, but there are many others, as new technologies are showing, that sort of indicate that we should start thinking about this again, uh, perhaps from a different angle, but we should think a lot about regulation on that. Um, so no, I'm not against a regulation. Uh, I don't think that regulation is going to solve everything also. I think that many questions that we have are questions of society and I see with a lot of concern when society demands that the regulator jumps in and tells them what's the ethical right thing to do. Because I think that ethical debates are cost intensive. They are demanding, they are exhausting for all of us, It's uh, and precisely now I mean, we have all these discussions with the AFD, which is the neo-Nazi, neoliberal movements that are happening here in Germany. We, but it, not only in Germany, in many other places, and and that's exhausting. Um, but this is what ethics costs. That's the cost of ethic. 
And I think it is still worth it to have those discussions. And we cannot hand them over to the regulator and say, tell us what's the definite the, def, uh, the, the final truth or the final ethical point, because ethics is a question of society and it evolves with society. So many aspects will not be possible to be regulated, but many others are. Respond or? Yeah. Okay. I, I, I do see the point about ethics changing with society. The only worry that I would have though, and this particularly is, is sort of in a workplace context, and again, I, I apologize if it's too parochially American-centered, but I, my worry is that when I look at the history of privacy regulation in the workplace uh, in the US, so many things have been sort of given away in the process of what could be characterized by a, say, a Hayek adherent as just voluntary free exchange. So you have you know, a large company saying to people, you know, we get to look at your email all the time. And then it's sort of like, well, we get to sort of have a camera on all the time. And then you have a situation where like the American Law Institute thinks it's really a very interesting problem as to, you know, does the employer get to actually watch the person's urine test? You know, does the employer get all the health records? How can they process the health records, et cetera? And I think that the reason why I bring this up is because when I look at the processes, when I hear the slogan of labor liberalization in Europe, and particularly, say, from the Macron campaign or other campaigns, you know, to liberalize labor rules, I think that simultaneously a lot of that will, if, you, if people are not careful, under the name of a blanket liberalization, there will be carte blanche given to gather all sorts of new data and to process it in other ways. And without the state sort of directly saying, you can't have this data or you can't use data for certain processes or certain uses, um, the record seems to indicate that the propensity of individuals is just to trade these things off, particularly with data, because for every little piece of data you give up, there's something uh, that I think the behavioral eco economists call hyperbolic discounting, where it doesn't seem like, oh, who cares if they know who my address is? Oh, who cares if they know my how many steps I take a day? Who cares if I have this? But by the time that you really, that some entity has this huge amount of data about you, and it's totally asymmetric, then it's too late. And so I think that just given some of the dynamics there, I am afraid that unless we as a society fix some rules in regulation, that we are very prone to becoming entirely transparent and giving up a lot of power over data collection and, and analysis. So. Yeah. Um, you the chance to in involve now. Um, I already see quite a lot of hands. Uh, can we have the microphone? Do you have one more there or do you want ours? Um, okay, I I'll, I'll s start here and then maybe we have a second one later. Thank you. Uh, so I, I'd like to ask basically a bit uh, provocative questions. And namely, um, is privacy still an issue given open possibility to use uh, accountable, of course, accountable algorithms in solidaric but not in egoistic way? In this case, uh, for example, uh, predicting possibility of someone's death would uh, be not uh, to take this person off the insurance or make it uh, more expensive, but to be ready to help this pe uh, person more effectively and have such structure in order to do it. And there's a need of open data from people's health records in order for realizing such scenario. Uh, so maybe we should struggle for such solidarity perspective of algorithms instead of uh, take only just defensive position securing our private data? Thank you. Yeah, this is a, this is a... Maybe we collect three because I think we've got quite a number. Um, thank you for this talk. Um, there's this uh, regulatory idea out there that uh, it would be good to have like an independent agency that does some, some kind of mandatory um, auditing of um, important algorithms out there. Um, and there has also been like a German minister who spoke out in favor of it. Do you think that this should be, or th that this is a good goal to push for politically? Uh, my question, 
come a little bit before all this wave of uh, technology. Uh, this is it possible to regulate to or make a policy, po policy uh, about how near the people or how far the people want to stay from technology? So if this is uh, possible or is this everybody must go on so near with the smartphones and everything? And my second question is, uh, this is discussing, I understand it's discussing in the, in the, in the field of ph philosophy and sociology, but I, am, I want to know if, if it's so discussing in the, in the field of psychology or aesthetics, for example, this, this points. Uh, can, I, can I just respond to that like immediately or no? I'm oh, sorry. Oh, yes, yes, please. Um, oh, well, I'll, I'll wait, I'll wait, I'm sorry. I, I yeah. think Oh, sure. Okay. So, I mean, I, I wanted to say aesthetically, one of the things that I really have found a fun project over the past couple months is something by Ben Grosser. He's an artist and he has something called Go Rando. And this actually goes to your point about psych both psychology and aesthetics, which is on Facebook, you can uh, respond to people's posts with, say, six emoji rather than just a like the six emoji. And what this program does, is if you, if you add it to your feed, is that it will randomly respond to everyone's posts. So it might respond happy to a sad post or sad to a happy post. And, and, and this was actually tied by this uh, uh, philosopher, this aesthetician, um, to the Dadaist resistance to a lot of totalitarianism. And sort of a sense that this was an automated public sphere that made so little sense and was under so little control by those subject to it that it was a rational response to merely go for a detournement, you know, just to, to sort of make a joke of the whole thing. And if you contact me after, oh, and by the way, my, my Twitter is at Frank Pasquale, and I, I can very easily be reached there or, or elsewhere, you know, so I, I'd love to continue the conversation because there's a lot of other um, uh, aesthetic responses. The psychology, though, is quite troubling to me because I really do think that there is such a potential to develop quite invasive and troubling psychological profiles, which brings us back to the first question, which is about the idea of solid solidarity uh, and a solidaristic approach to algorithms, particularly with response to health data. I have an article from 2013 called Grand Bargains for Big Data, which goes in exactly this direction. It tries to sort of lay out a framework whereby the minimum standards of rights and res rights of data subjects and responsibilities of data holders that I would consider necessary for what in the US we often call a learning healthcare system, a healthcare system that breaks down the boundaries between clinical research or clinical treatment and research. And I do have a lot of hope there. I just have to say though that there, it, it's going, it's, a, it's an attitude that I would have more comfort with in Europe than I would have in the US because I think that here there is a bit more of a record of concern about health data. Although even there, I would say that people who have this ideal of a solidaristic, solidaristic approach should look closely at the Google DeepMind deal that went down in England uh, or in the UK, even while the UK was a member of the European Union. I believe that that deal had many, was legally defective in many ways. And there's a piece by Julia Powell's that went into that. And I think that that is uh, something, to, is a cause for concern. The final question with respect to the, the, a special entity that would be auditing, I am absolutely in favor of that. However, I think the experience of the US Office of Financial Research is a cautionary tale because there, after the financial crisis of 2008, there was specific legislation under the Dodd-Frank Act to empower a staff of, I think, 150, 200 people within the Treasury Department to particularly monitor data flows, et cetera, and the algorithms of finance. I talked to some of the top people there and I asked them, if your office were in existence in 2007, could it have warned about the financial crisis? They said no. Then I asked, in two th what about during the European uh, crisis with respect to you know, the, the Greek debt crisis? And I said, well, well, can you tell us, is there gonna be a crisis? They said, no, we can't tell you that either. And so, and so the problem was, of course, there was too much proprietary information. So such an agency has to have access to lots more proprietary information than the current agencies do. Also, it needs independent funding. It needs something like self-funding. It can't be subject to, I think, to capture, it can't be too subject to capture. So. Yeah, so those would be the, the three responses I would have. Yeah. Um, I just answer to that one, to the last question that you addressed, um, because that is of course something that 
um, many people are thinking about right now. And Algorithm Watch, I mean, we say that we are a watchdog organization, an advocacy organization that is trying to shed some light on these uh, automated decision-making systems. But uh, one of the tasks or one of the challenges we are up against is that exactly you need some regulation, first of all, to force people to give you information if they don't want to. And we have that example of the credit, German credit uh, scoring agency that uh, was taken to court to, um, to release information. And um, the highest civil court decided that they don't have to. And now it's uh, going to the constitutional court. And we'll see what happens. But it may, might uh, take a while. Um, and uh, the example that is often used here, and I use the German term because there's not really a good uh, translation for it, the uh, Algorithmen TÜV. Um, um, you know, it's like the um, it's a, a car safety agency that is in that is very famous in Germany because all German cars need to go uh, every other year to a safety check to that agency. Um, and what is good about that example, what I like about this analogy, um, is that it's a combination of different things. You have to have the regulation that puts that agency in place. Um, you have to have the agency itself and the expertise, and you were alluding to that, you know, the people who um, probably don't even have the knowledge to deal with all this data, and, and you said they didn't have enough access, uh, and you have to enforce the law and the, um, the possibilities or the opportunities of these people to really look into the systems in a sense that uh, they can find problematic um, things that are going on there. So in, in that case, or in that sense, I think it's a good example or it's a good analogy, this uh, threefold approach. Um, but many people, and we are still, you know, in the process of making up our minds on that, um, think it is a rather problematic approach to um, analyze and um, probably even make decisions on the value or the uh, correctness uh, of these algorithms beforehand, you know, supplying information to this agency and they would check are, they, are these algorithms okay, can they be used? Because in most cases you can't say anything about the use of these algorithms if you don't have the data that is being assembled and that needs to be analyzed. So it's, it, it doesn't seem to be a good idea to have this agency look into the algorithms or the automated decision-making systems before they are in place. Sounds like a weakening factor because, you know, once they are up and running, they might do some harm, but, you know, that's the risk that we probably need to take. So just an immediate response to that is that there is a literature by uh, uh, Andrew Tutt has an article called an FDA for algorithms, sort of trying to apply the, the medical analogy there. So I, I will just, uh, and, and I, yeah, but I, I don't want to take too much time. Yeah. <laughs> well, I would only add to what Matthias said that um, I think we should start thinking of iterative um, revisions. Um, you uh, Algorithms change, especially complex algorithms are in constant change. So I, I, I really like also the analogy of that core agency because you have to go every, every I think, how, how many, every two years in Germany? In Spain it's longer. Uh, hmm. <laughs> what does it say? It's about Ha! Oh, well, so if, 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 if there was some iteration on that and some certificate that has been extended after that and uh, companies need to show publicly that that, 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 might, that might have some teeth to that. And I think it, it really makes no sense to do it before. Uh, and it, did, it doesn't make sense to do it in one shot. It really needs to be on constant, um, under constant proof, as we see with, for instance, the Google search algorithm. It's being changed constantly. And um, I think there are many other th um, types of algorithms that we are going to have the next years. And uh, we will only be able to address them from a very through stadium of development if it's done on that um, basis. But I also think that um, we are all thinking on a very uh, commercial perspective. We are not aware, and this is one of the questions I think that you, um, that the lady in the orange scarf was addressing. There are many algorithms that no car 
agency similar um, institution is going to see, for instance, the algorithms that are going to be used for border control. Um, from uh, within the next months, um, all 27 members of the European Union are going to start automatizing their borders because we passed the PNR, which is a um, directive that means that um, um, with regards to um, or for the sake of national security and against terrorism, um, all member states are going to have to use um, automatic algorithmic processes um, when uh, for, for the passenger named records to understand who might be a terrorist and who might not. And, um, and those algorithms um, might, might only be able to be looked by a very specific group of people that work in the government. And of course, there is also the difficulty with regards to algorithms that are used by the public hand, that they might be hackable. And um, that seems at first sight for many of us not a problem, but if we're talking about hacking algorithms that are being used for um, taxing and calculating which people should have, should what, what people should pay um, to, to, as a tax, uh, that might turn a problem. So um, I think we need to start um, straying away from the one solution fits all idea that we started in Europe. And I think this is one of the problems with the GDPR, that it's the idea of one size fits all, one solution might be applied to all, and it does not work. And um, with regards to the um, to the question of whether there is people that is detachable, that can escape technology, I would say no, there's no way. Even people that are not online are somehow in the net because they are citizens of a state. So uh, the state has their data and their data banks and this data is being handled even though they don't realize. But also because we all process data automatically because we use our uh, our cell phones and we do pictures and there's people uh, around us when we do those pictures and there are many many things many data that we are producing without realizing even people that do not own a smartphone even people that do not go to the use the internet and uh, even indigents are able uh, people without um, passports are, are also within the net because of the cameras that we have outside because of many many other technologies that are just simply constantly grabbing data so um, there is no way to say um, not even rich people and I think one of the last things I would like to say in that issue to provoke you, all of you, a bit is um, I think we, we all have this discussion about technology as something that is a third body outside ourselves that might, um, that might sort of be threatening. And the first thing that I want to say on that is it's human made, so it has human bias and it's very much not outside us, it belongs to us. Um, and we need to start thinking about that, not as something that alienates us, but as a further thinking and a further um, development of how we humans try to cope with our everyday life. And sometimes we cope with that badly, and sometimes we cope with that good or good enough. That's the first thing. And the second thing that I um, want to say with regards to um, the concept of, um, of, of, of machines and automatization is that uh, in much of the discussions we're having, the fear is that we are being manipulated, but we at the same time ask for responsibility and ask people to be responsible. And there is an incoherence there, because if we think, if we have the a deterministic concept of human beings, and we think that human beings are so easy to trick with, that machines can manipulate their, their will without them even realizing, then we cannot talk about responsibility anymore. Because there's nothing that human beings can do uh, to be responsible of, because responsibility relies pretty much on the concept of free will. 
And I want to make here a, a, a optimistic point because when I look at what people do, when I look at the practices of algorithms, not I, I, I see the risk, I know about the risk, but then I also look about the practices and what, how young people are using, it, are using uh, automatization processes. And I do realize people are intelligent. People do not understand perhaps black box uh, uh, very specifically, but they do see sometimes that there's some sort of automatization happening. And I think it was Dana Boyd using that case of uh, youth using the um, algorithmic um, processes for advertising at Facebook and sending tampons, uh, tampons to, the, to their friends. So provoking the algorithm in such a way that the algorithm would think, well, this person using Facebook right now is, um, is a teenager and is a female teenager. And that wouldn't be the case. That would be a male teenager using, uh, using the account. So, th I mean, I, I, I see a lot of faces that I don't understand the example. Well, the example is about just male teenagers sending advertisement as to, the, to their friends, to their male friends, as if they were female friends. So they would get tampons and they would get period products and makeup and all the stuff, even though they were guys. And that was a way of tricking the algorithm and just to make a joke. But this sort of also proves that people do come up with uh, a sense that there is some automatization there and a sense that they can play with that. And um, I think we, we, we should not forget that, that human beings are less... Um, that there is a tipping point where people do realize where manipulation is happening and that there is always um, a free will concept in which I very much believe and we all seem to believe in because we have this sanction system and criminal system that is pretty much based on the concept of free will and taking responsibility and because we have those words in our language and every language has that word of responsibility, of uh, being a criminal, of being uh, in charge of something and that means something, that must mean something to all of us in our cultures. Hi. Um, thanks for the talk and your comments. Firstly, I would ask, I would like to ask a question about this cascading tendency that you pointed to in terms of how um, algorithmic metrics are applied. And it seems to me that this tendency goes all the way back to the core of how financial markets and capital works. And you sort of exposed that it's not neutral at all if we think of, you know, our belief that like in a society, what happens in one sphere of someone's life should not affect what happens in another person's sphere of life. So do you think in the benefits of egalitarianism, we should propose, propose the opposite tendency, which is that what detriments someone in one sphere of their life should provoke a benefit in another part of someone's life, or is that too communist? And my second question um, is, uh, so you, you mentioned that a lot of American corporations are becoming really powerful and adopting a judicial role. So do you think that there's some chance that the judiciary will start using these same ways, these same techniques to assess people? Or do you think what's more likely is that America will go full black mirror and that these corporations will become very powerful and infiltrate people's lives uh, through socialization and through the Internet of Things and therefore become more powerful than the judiciary? Hi. Um, hello, um, you three. Um, so it was presented um, in the um, Republica these days. Um, um, kind of constitution that um, German foundation is, well, kind of has, yeah, I think you are <laughs> kind of related to that foundation, um, about like fundamental rights in the digital era. And there's the GDPR as well with 
this um, chief protection or data protection officer, which is supposed to be a, an independent figure watching the use of data within corporations. So there was a talk about um, an independent agency as well. So I would like to ask you what type of regulation would make more sense for like holding um, algorithms accountable? Thank you. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for your interesting points. I'm, I'm taking a lot home today to think about. And I have both first a point to make and then a question. The point is that I found this event on Facebook about two days ago, and it appeared just randomly on my newsfeed. Um, and I'm very sure that that relates to the person I am and the research I do. Um, so I think this is, this is really a good example of an algorithm doing its job very well and, and to my benefit as a consumer. Um, the question I have relates to, again, the GDPR, because I, I'm a lawyer interested in EU law and specifically data protection law. Um, now, now I, 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 from both of you who talked about the GDPR, I, I heard a a few skeptical tones in that respect. To, we will have to see how it turns out, really. Um, but, but I would be interested in whether you already have an idea or ideas how it could have been done better, not only the GDPR in itself, but also relating to trade secrets and how, for example, the ru rules applying to trade secrets could be changed and modified in order to create a more balanced legal situation. Thank you. Um, thank you. Frank, you said that um, how do we make, you asked how do we make the computer scientists more responsive to human values. The answer has already been floated here. The answer is the humanities. Study art, study literature, study jurisprudence. Um, Unfortunately, I don't know about Germany, but in the UK, if you're a computer scientist, scientist, you only study computer science, you don't study the humanities. No one from the computer science class took my Shakespeare class at the University of Warwick. Right? They would have been a better person had they done that. Okay. But even in the humanities, there's an algorithm now. And that algorithm is that you get hired only if you bring funds to the university. That's it. That's what's going on. So everything is being sub subsumed under the algorithm. Of course, because the algorithm is still, is still super structural. The base of all this is MCM prime. It's the one word that's not been said here today at the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, which is capitalism. <laughs> right? Okay, now one of the things that dialectic materialists do is we follow the contradiction into its endpoint, into its singularity. And it, it, it could be that this technique of thinking algorithmically, and I don't know my maths very well, so excuse me if I say something wrong here, but is there something in algorithmic thinking that could help us think about how to evolve to the next step beyond capitalism? Is algorithmic thinking in any way revolutionary? Is there something we can learn from it? That's my question. I want to start with the last one, just in terms of, um, there's actually a thinker, uh, a guy who is uh, in operations research, I believe, uh, named Andrew Adlisko, who's said uh, th that big data will be the death of capitalism because essentially it portends so much knowledge and power in such big firms that it makes such a mockery of competition and the com competitive ideals. So that's one of Adlisko's uh, presentations. I don't know if he's published it yet, but if you look at like Eden Medina's work on the CyberSyn system that was in Allende's Chile, again, very interesting thoughts about how when you have one firm that knows so much about what all the suppliers are doing, what all the customers are doing, I mean, that seems to be the logic. If, you're, if the logic of your company is to organize the world's information, which is the logic of Google, then it seems as though you really are about a couple of steps from the vision that was in that novel Red Plenty of what the folks were doing in economic planning in the Soviet Union in the 20s and 30s, right? Um, except that, you know, so that's, that really is, it really is that fundamental a challenge to economic systems. I think you're right about that. 
I want to connect the question about trade secrets and the question about um, uh, Black Mirror, and <laughs> because I think those are, those go together quite naturally, which is to say that you know if we don't have a great deal of reform of trade secrecy, we are in at risk of essentially outsourcing incredibly critical decisions about human welfare and life chances to unaccountable private entities. And I would say with respect to balance here, I started five to 10 years ago being, uh, trying to sort of square the circle of trade secrecy and rankings and ratings involving human beings. And I finally have given up on it. And I find, finally find it um, quite troubling and would not allow trade secret as the form of intellectual property protection here. I would say if you want intellectual property protection, go to patent, maybe copyright, but not to trade secrecy. And this is something that, you know, if you look at the recent editorial in Wired by Jason Tashea about um, uh, the use of proprietary algorithms to help judges in sentencing prisoners in the US, he says flat out it's ridiculous. Michael Veal, who's an algorithmic accountability researcher, researcher in England, I've seen him tweeted that, tweeting that it's ridiculous. And I would extend their skepticism about proprietary algorithms in the criminal justice process to any algorithms used to rank and rate human beings. By the way, that gives the computer scientist, the scientist, free reign with anything involving food or the earth or perhaps even animals, you know? It's just, this is a way of marking out the human as something that is to be treated in a distinctly, distinctly respectful way. And I think that will have deeper roots in European jurisprudence of dignity than it will in the US jurisprudence where that is a much more contested uh, concept and much harder to find juridical application of. I'd finally say with respect to the other question about uh, people's trouble in one aspect of life leading to help in other aspects of their lives, I think that is a really interesting question of redistribution. And I think that that is an area that will, that could spark a whole branch of study in the algorithmic accountability movement in terms of are there ways of creating positive knock-on effects to help people rather than helping the authors and users of algorithms be more effective predators on human misery. And I think that, you know, if we want to really take that idea seriously, we should, and we should look into ways in which it would either be illegal to create those sorts of knock-on effects or exactly the type of um, comp compensatory effects that you're describing would be part of the system. So, great idea, yeah. Um, do you also? Um, yeah, I, I, I focus one, on, on one of those questions, and um, that is the one about what's going to help um, educating people who are in, um, in, in the profession of developing these systems um, on ethics and, um, and the ideas behind that. And I think it's a, I mean, this is just a permanent struggle, and it's not new. I mean, the the question that we are addressing here is not new because we know that from biology, we know that from physics. In all these professions, the, uh, basically the challenge was to how to um, integrate values that we agree on uh, into these fields of study and into the technologies that emerge from them. Um, and this is not over because many of us know the discussions that are going on about um, about gene therapy and how to use it. And I mean, the the, the entire discussion about using atomic energy in Germany is very very uh, prevalent. So this is something that we've seen in other professions, and we can probably learn from those professions in trying to. Uh, apply that to computer science and and how to deal with the challenge that algorithms pose and automated decision making poses right right now and of course i mean i'm <laughs> i'm not addressing that capitalism question that <laughs> is overarching this whole argument because i don't have a good answer to that honestly half an hour um Okay, um, there are, I think, a few questions left. Um, but I would also like to start with the last question, uh, or the last point, the last remark. Um, I do have some struggle to talk about algorithmic thinking, because algorithms do not think. The concept, the way um, algorithmic processes work are, cause, are causal processes. 
causal, causality is not a logic process. It's quite the contrary of logic. And uh, this is something that it's being sometime, sometimes forgotten because in the 1930s, Alonso Church and Turing made this experiment to try to um, test whether machines can be somehow logical or whether logic can be coded. And they realized that no, it's not possible because the way we, um, because the way how logic is made and consists is simply, um, it depends of levels of contextualization, uh, it depends on language, it depends on uh, different types of abstract levels of comparison that machines are not able to even formalize in a language, in the coding language. So um, there is no algorithmic thinking. Actually, the way it is, um, it is working is a very old way of computing that is being done since the ancient times. Actually, we had this discussion in the theory of science for over thousands of years where we discussed, okay, there are two ways to approach, to make a theory. You can go the inductive way or you can go the deductive way. So you start with a theory and then you try to find proof of what your theory is. Or you go the other way around. You take a look at what you see next to you and you collect all this data and then you make out of this data a theory. And algorithms work exactly like this last thing, inductively. They look at things and uh, then they try to make something out of that. Um, and what they make out of that is a sort of correlation. And this correlation might be something that when Japanese um, have uh, sushi to eat, specific sushi to eat at this time, um, there is an immigration of birds in um, Canada. That might be a correlation uh, that they come up with. And the and this shows that these sort of correlations are just simply algorithms are being able to identify patterns, and those patterns might have similarity. And there might be a perfectly um, a, a, a perfect correlation for those different types of events, but there just might be a coincidence. We, um, uh, one of our, in our team is a professor for graph theory, and she developed uh, an algorithm for movie curation. And that algorithm was afterwards used for cancer research. And um, what you see is that those algorithms just simply use patterns and try to identify patterns and work in specific ways. And with that, um, they can explain you that there is some sort of coincidence or some, some sort of thing there that should be looked at. But they cannot explain you why. And this is actually the things that make science even uh, more complicated than one, what algorithms would ever do. Uh, so uh, what we see, for instance, in medicine is that the algorithms can tell you, okay, this is a, a, a most probably a cancer type so-and-so, and the probability to live is, uh, or to succeed with the chemo is so-and-so, but they cannot tell you many other things that you will need as a doctor to um, use for the right therapy and to sort of see whether there's a difference, differential diagnosis and that person does not have cancer, but something different. Um, so I still don't see artificial intelligence coming or I don't understand, I, I wouldn't use the word intelligence for that because for me it's pretty dumb what they actually do. Um, with regards to better regulation, well, the thing is that regulation right now is very technique oriented and technology changes. The way we started with data protection was thinking and the way it was, it, data protection is very much concentrated on the processing of personal data. And it really much concentrates on how it's gathered, how it's processed, how it's um, stored, etc. And it does not concentrate concentrate on actually the human value that you want to protect behind that. Is that personal rights? Is that dignity? Is that privacy? Is that discrimination? Um, so that is a problem because actually laws were supposed to be made to protect human values, to protect things about, to, to protect um, social aspects of life. They were not meant to concentrate on technologies 
that precisely evolve within months. And this is one of the reasons why um, data protection, the GDPR does not understand the cloud, it does not understand big data, it does not even understand scoring. And, um, and that is a problem. Um, that we have right now in the whole discussions that we think that if we concentrate on regulating algorithms um, by sort of um, trying to understand the process, the algorithmic process, and then trying to put some restraints there, that we might be able to address all the problems, all the human problems and social conflicts that might be addressed behind. But the thing is, automatization is going to happen everywhere. It's going to happen in education. It's going to happen in um, in the economy, it's going to happen in um, health care, in the workplace, in many, many places. So it's going to permeate all law corpora that we have already. And all law corpora should somehow try to address this sort of, pro of problems. It, I don't think that it makes sense to create a specific law for that. I do think that there is a value in data protection, but not for what is right now being used. Um, and um, the way I would address that would be also first having on the first place an idea of what is the human value that I want to protect and then concentrate on a secondary and third level uh, on what types of processes one might be able to uh, allow or not. But again, I also think that when we talk about discrimination, the way of addressing discrimination is not by concentrating on the technical part of discrimination. Um, and um, with regards to your comment that you made about inequality and egalitarianism, well, we actually in Europe have social capitalism, and it is pretty much based on concepts like John Rawls, ironically, uh, an American philosopher, um, has been developing in the 70s. And uh, we, we, we also started thinking about that in the 20th century of how to, um, to put it with Aristotle's words, to, to be just and to be fair to people by treating equals equally and unequals unequally. Um, and that might seem a bit abstract, but this means that if you um, if you have some disparity in society, that you're entitled to have uh, some sort of support from the state based on taxpayer money, uh, so that you can have the same chances that someone else uh, would have, if because it has a different background. So um, there is already um, regulation focusing on this type of ideas, and I think we should look at there because actually. Um, what we all fear and are discussing right now is not a question pretty much of technology, but a question of social conflicts. And by focusing too much on technology, we're losing the human values that we actually want to protect. And that's uh, the, the trade-off that we're additionally doing by saying, okay, um, let's put the constraints in the epistemic level so that we don't get people to know. But the thing, the thing with ethics, the thing with fairness is that to be fair, you need more data. You need more knowledge. If you don't know enough, you won't be able to make a fair judgment of someone. And to put an example on that, scoring in Germany um, had a regulation before the GDPR came that said, well, scoring companies are not allowed to make their scores based mainly on location data. Because that's a way where you can see, okay, that's Kreuzberg, there's many people with migration background, ha, <laughs> ha, are going to have a bad level and the others are better. So the regulation tried to say there are more that and more specific that that needs to be leveled. And uh, the regulation that we had in Germany said, we will not decide which type of data, but we demand that it must be a scientific team that does that. So every scoring company in Germany had to contact scientists and had to work with them on a scoring uh, formula. And by the way, this is disappearing with the GDPR. Uh, many of the protections that we have with regards to scoring, with the Schufa and all the stuff in Germany, it's not going to be because the regulators forgot about that. So from 2018 on, you will not be able 
Probably, it depends on what the Schufa does, but the Schufa is the, core, the biggest scoring company in Germany. But actually, from my 2018, they are not obliged to give you your score. Okay, um, can everyone put uh, her, his hand up who still wants to raise a question? So we have three more, that's perfect. Uh, maybe there was a microphone in the back. Marcos, um, do you see it? And then we go to the front. I want to say um, capitalis capitalism again and Rosa Luxemburg. Rosa Luxemburg was one of the early queens of colonization theory. And what we see happening with big data and algorithms is exactly a colonization type of thing going on. And what Rosa Luxemburg pointed out is that uh, capitalism won't work as long as you ha don't have empty, not yet colonized spaces for capital to colonize in. So seeing it this way, a completely new criteria comes in. It's, it's exchange value. If I understood you right in your talk, Frank, you point out the problem between different use values. And you proposed taxation as one method to, to regulate the competition between different use values. But as long as in a capitalized field, everything is dominated by exchange value, it won't change anything. It will just, it will legalize. It will um, tighten what happened. It will like formalize the colonization that happened by taxation. And now my question, what, what did you think to, to put taxes on? Or more particular, did you ever think about put taxes on the use of closed source software? Uh, did you think about taxing um, intransparent interfaces? intransparent database structures and stuff like that. Everything that is not open source and controllable and takeable for a different purpose. So by, by doing that, and now I'm, I'm really like going on insecure terrain and, and really asking, maybe you have ideas, taxation could, could maybe Change, change anything, change something, so. Thanks. Um, now, here in the front, though. Okay, one question. Hi, thanks. Um, until recently, I was living in, uh, in Myanmar, and after working in a social field for a bit, uh, I was joining an internet startup there. And uh, what they were doing were basically they, they were building a Google for Myanmar language. Um, and um, what, I, what I want to say is that we realized in Myanmar that people were basically skipping search on Google and they were directly diving into feed. I think that was what Frank was mentioning that um, we were seeing, and also here in Germany, I think, the, the trend that we are going from, from searching actively for information towards being informed. Um, and we see that on Facebook. So um, if, I'm, if I'm using Facebook, um, what face, like the, the goal of Facebook, of course, is that it wants to give me a pleasant experience, a pleasant user experience. Um, this is achieved by giving me content that I will enjoy. Um, psychologically, I'm not enjoying content which is contradicting my opinion or like going against my own uh, opinion, right? So what Facebook is doing is that it will it will create individual bubbles. So let's say for me, uh, me for example, I'm a, I'm a liberal, right? So uh, in Facebook, I will most likely not 
hear any of your uh, opinions, maybe because <laughs> because I will not be I, I will not be uh, exposed to these uh, opinions because Facebook will try to prevent me from uh, being conf uh, confronted with uh, with opinions which are not mine. So um, what I see is a threat, basically a like kind of a threat to uh, to democratic systems that we have our our own little bubbles and. Um, we are like, there is like a reality created for each one of us, which gives us the feeling that our opinion is is the only one which is which is right. And I saw this with like talking with a lot of Hillary uh, Hillary supporters, which are saying like, this is amazing because like, I literally haven't seen anyone who's voting for Trump because they just are not exposed to these people, because algorithms are keeping them from being exposed to, to these kind of opinions. So uh, do you see, a, like, how can, we, how can we overcome these, these threats? Because they are based on, on our psychology, basically, right? I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. OK, mm -hmm. I think yours is the last question, or did I forget anyone? Okay, yeah. so. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I have two questions, just to understand the algorithm watch concept in a way. And I understood the part when you say we want to, ha uh, to, to, to look on algorithms and make them accountable, maybe for undemocratic outcomes or discrimination. And let's say in the public sphere, where we would say um, um, public institutions are accountable to democratic principles, not to discriminate people. So now we see a big part of the algorithms applied in private companies where we have a long history of discrimination. Let's say American banks that discriminated for centuries black people, um, giving credit or whatever. So, so how do you deal with this field where the, let's say, the decision making of algorithms is not in the public sphere, it's not accountable to democratic principles, and where the power situation is totally against the people and maybe we are all customized to discriminatory alg algorithms that for example Amazon is not supplying certain areas with, with bad credit scores, they cannot get uh, deliveries and pay later so they have to pay first and all, all this stuff. So, so how do you deal with this field and how do you question the power relations that are behind these algorithms? And of course let's say the, the, the coming to the point uh, I think the political question is the regula regulatory question. How to regulate uh, the property of the data, how to regulate these fields. And I, 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 would, uh, I would look not for guidelines or ethic principles, I would look for concrete regulation in the lawmaker sense and to enforce this regulation because the privacy, what, what, what can I do if Google is not respecting my privacy? Oh my gosh. So I'm totally, there's no for, form to enforce it. There are no big fines. It's really a big problem and I don't, don't see anything in, in that way. So if you have some ideas for binding regulation, would would help me a lot. Thank you. Okay. Who of you wants to start? I think we have to fast forward a bit. Be quick. I will try to be very quick. I promise. I'm sorry. <laughs> so. I, I guess the easiest way I can deal with the filter bubble question is to say that I just gave a talk at Republica that's on YouTube, and at about minute 31, I talk about the filter bubble. <laughs> and so I, but I mean, my bottom line there is to say that I am worried that to the extent you try to break certain tolerant and open people's filter bubble and expose them to more views that are um, hate-filled, extremist, and intolerant. What's ironic is that the tolerance of the intolerance can lead the tolerant to become intolerant. Right? <laughs> so and that's my ultimate worry about the filter bubble. And it also, it actually mirrors uh, feminist scholarship on how a lot of, in a lot of households that they have studied, um, the baseline would continually shift where the man would refuse to do certain housework and the woman would keep doing more and more and more. And then, you know, it's like, so I mean, there's the problem is that if you have certain ways in which people are not, one person is not meeting the other halfway, it can be very troubling. So that's, that's one, my worry about sort of framing the problem as a filter bubble problem, filter bubble problem. With respect to taxation and closed systems versus open systems, et cetera, I would say that, you know, this type of things that me and Lanier are advocating for, are kind of a, an effort to make up for an unintended consequence of movements like Creative Commons, open software, open licensing, or open, openness movements, because essentially what we've seen is that you, know, you have a company like Google that says to all of the copyright holders in the world, 
you know, everything you do, our use of it should be a fair use. Like, we should get to use that for free, right? And on some level, I like that, but on the other level, I want to say that, you know, if, we, if the rule were the opposite, they had to negotiate individually with every website, forget it, that you could never construct something like Google, right? But on the other hand, if you have a binary what where suddenly the owners of the copyrighted material have no ability to stop certain forms of use of their material once it's on the web without a robots.txt tag on, on the website, that's troubling. And so that's what the taxation is meant to do. It's meant to essentially make up for some of the problems that occur when lots of content is treated as open access. I would say that with respect to the comment on regulation, I guess the you, you had a many a very nuanced comment. My one response would be that you're I'm completely in agreement with you on the nature of fines and regulation because I do think that, you know, drawing on the social theory of Niklas Luhmann, a lot of these systems only really understand one thing, like money, right? And if you do not take a big bite, a big monetary bite out of Google, not the absurd US fines of twenty thousand dollars or something like that. I mean, which is just to me utterly laughable, and it's laughable that any regulator could think that they could levy such a fine with a straight face. But you know, if you have the type of fines that were contemplated by, I think, uh, one of the past commissioners um, in like the one, two percent of global turnover, that's a real fine. That makes a difference. So that's one thing we really have to start thinking about is that level of fine, not the kind of just slap on the wrist that you know, becomes a cost of doing business. So, uh, yeah, there was, there was especially one question on algorithm watch. Um. Yeah, at least uh, um, I'd, I'd, I'd like to comment quickly on that one. Basically, the only thing that we can do, and I, but I don't think it's, it's little, is um, we are trying to infuse that discussion into the democratic process that we have. And we still believe that we do have it in at least this country and many other countries, not all countries, of course. But uh, when we are uh, looking at Germany, what you usually do is if you see something of the scale of what we at least identify in these um, uh, new discussions about automated decision making and, and algorithms and big data, then we want to make people aware that we have an issue here that needs to be discussed. And um, the the thing is that we basically started a year ago, just one year ago, I mean we started thinking about doing something like Algorithm Watch a couple of months earlier, but we launched our website, which was basically the point when we were public and we existed as an initiative exactly a year ago. And we've been in this field, many, I mean three of the four of us were in this field before working for non-governmental organizations as journalists, so um, um, making people aware of certain issues that are close to our heart, still we were really surprised by the effects that we had. I mean, effects not in the sense that anything has changed yet in a material sense, that there is regulation now because we asked for it or anything, but the um, attention that this question gets, that Algorithm Watch gets, but only as part of this whole discussion. I mean, there's a lot of things going on. And I mean, look at the Republica this year, how many talks on algorithms and algorithmic decision-making there were. And journalists chasing <laughs> Frank around the room, right? Uh, wanting to get an interview with him and, and putting it on national TV. So there is a change there, and we need to um, contribute to that change in the discussion about these systems. and step by step work out solutions. The thing is, we're not there yet. I mean, we have suggestions, but we can't really claim that we have solutions. But this is what, what we're doing, right? Perhaps to add to that, um, also very quickly, um, if you want to know, if your question is more about what we do concretely, uh, we've been gathering money to uh, look at diverse algorithms, and that is going to happen within the next months. Uh, partly we are going to reverse engineer stuff, partly we're just going to uh, go to companies and talk with them and uh, see what they do, how they do that, and take a look whether there is a juridical gap within that practice and a blind spot that we need to address and give concrete solutions for that. 
uh, both juridical and also from uh, the practical point of view and the technical point of view. It's four of us. The fourth person is the person doing the algorithmic magic. Uh, it's Nina Zweig, she's professor for graph theory in Kaiserslautern. And um, and we've been doing already, in, I mean, until we, we started gathering money for doing this because it takes, uh, well, it, it takes, you need money to analyze algorithm, algorithmic processes. So, um, so, um, We've been also analyzing other algorithms. We've been starting a small mapping of what types of algor algorithms are out there and are being um, used for what type of fields, but we're still like very much in the making. And those are the projects that we are starting right now uh, and uh, that you will hopefully hear more within the next months to years because we, we plan to stay here for a while. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, you three. Um, thank you also, Lorenz, um, for coming. Uh, thank you all um, for being here and asking those questions. Um, I hope uh, we will continue this talk. Um, maybe uh, when Frank is back in Europe, we will invite you again. And um, I guess you all will be continuing talking about um, this topic and um, um, go and organize yourself and uh, we'll see what happens. <laughs>